This is a production of Cornell University. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming today to um, help celebrate and learn more about the CAHA program, the Cornell Africa um, Horticulture Assistantship. And this is a, a really tremendous program that we have here in, in um, the section of horticulture in the uh, School of Integrated Plant Sciences. Um, it's now, what Chris, about almost 20 years in the, in the making just shy of 20 years. And it's um, a program that has, is really um, meant to build uh, sustained uh, deep relationships between um, horticulture at Cornell and horticulture in Africa. And I think you're going to hear today um, some wonderful examples of how that's happening. And then we also have a wonderful um, new chapter to the Kaha story that we'll learn about today. Um, it is expanding and um, growing a new, a new opportunity. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more today. I wanted to draw your attention to this article that came out in the Cornell Chronicle um, last week about the program. And if you didn't get a chance to read it, um, I encourage you to read it. Um, I think you'll be inspired to after hearing from all of the people uh, featured in the story today. So we're gonna have um, uh, the opportunity to hear from four people today. We're going to start by um, hearing from Professor Chris Ween, who was, is an emeritus professor from horticulture. He's here a long time before he retired a few years ago. And it's really Chris's vision that has built the Kaha program. Um, the, then we will hear from Kalanga Banda, who is our Kaha student who is finishing her PhD um, here at Cornell. We will then hear from Phil Griffiths, who is uh, was a mentor to the first Kaha scholar. And so he now can look back on the last decade or so and, and reflect on how the program has um, built that um, sustained bridge between Cornell and Africa. And then we'll hear from Julianne, who is our incoming Kaha student. She just joined us this fall from Uganda. And so she's got an exciting road ahead. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over and then after we'll have about 15 minutes for discussion. So please um, uh, do, do stay for um, a discussion with all four speakers afterwards. Okay, Chris, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to be back at Cornell. Uh, and it's nice to be able to acquaint you with or review with you a program which we got started initially anonymously uh, in about 2006 or so. And uh, it's been going on, and uh, I'm very happy that that's the case. If this is going well, yes. Um, so I guess I've been in love with Cornell for quite a long time. I came here as a graduate student in 1964, uh, and uh, in the old veg crops department, and then. Uh, went through a master's degree working mostly on domestic problems. And I'd come from Canada where tropics are not existent. And, uh, but I was always interested in tropics and Cornell just has this wonderful uh, set of opportunities for someone's interest in tropics that doesn't necessarily come from there. And so uh, in 1968, the International Ag Program had a trip during the uh, winter break uh, to Puerto Rico. And this was the first time that this course was doing this, 11 days going around in January. We're here, it's distinctly inhospitable, as you know, uh, to go to the tropics where everything's green and growing and just wonderful. Uh, and we learned about agriculture in all parts of Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed that tremendously. And uh, I had already started thinking of maybe doing a PhD thesis that combined some work in the tropics. And at that point, the uh, Cornell University of the Philippines program had gotten started and was inviting graduate students to do their thesis research in the Philippines. 
even ones coming from Canada. <laughs> who would who would think such a thing? And so uh, my wife and I, uh, let me see if that, not very well. Anyway, it's her, uh, my late wife, uh, Betty, uh, and I went to the Philippines in 1968, stayed at the University of Philippines. I did part of my PhD thesis research there, helped in some teaching, uh, traveled all over the Philippine Islands, just enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, uh, so that was a, a unique experience as far as I was concerned, uh, and a very enjoyable one. Then uh, in 1972, so I came back, finished my PhD, did a year's postdoc again in veg crops. And uh, in 1972, uh, the vice uh, director of the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria, in Ibadan, uh, came around looking for someone to do grain legume physiology to become a member of their, their staff. I said, well, I did beans in the Philippines, would that count? And he said, sure, yeah, so come on. <laughs> so okay so we spent seven years uh, in Nigeria uh, and traveled all over the continent uh, had projects in Tanzania and Niger and also visited a bunch of other countries just loved it uh, tremendously at the end of the seven years uh, my wife informed me I'm going home <laughs> you make your mind up and I said, well, if I stay longer in IITA, I would be a tropical horticulturist and maybe I would just as soon dabble in it rather than have it as a full-time job. And so we came back. Uh, Cornell was looking for somebody to do veg crops work. Uh, so I came back into the old department and uh, became uh, just the faculty member here I, and again, there were possibilities of still being engaged in uh, in tropical agriculture, and I was lucky enough to uh, uh, dabble in, in in some of that, including the Cornell International Institute for Food Agriculture and Development (CFAD), which had a, uh, established a program in Zimbabwe at the University of Zimbabwe. It was somewhat similar to the work that uh, uh, the UPCO program was doing and uh, smaller scale and not as long term, but uh, nevertheless uh, interesting. And so I participated in that, led some of the effort, but you can see from the summary, 19 faculty members involved, Students from the University of Zimbabwe came to Cornell, got Cornell degrees, and then two students did part of their thesis work. The students from here did their thesis work there. So it was a similar program, but it continued our involvement in Africa, and uh, to me was was fascinating. So. The University of Philippine program, I just want to go back to that uh, briefly, is uh, one that uh, essentially started the international ag program at Cornell. It was in the 1950s, shortly after the Second World War, the University of Philippines had been occupied by Japan. Uh, the uh, campus was used by the Japanese for internment of prisoners and uh, the campus was in pretty sad shape. And with some funding from USAID, as well as later on from Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, that program was really quite a, a long-term program involving many Cornell professors who spent one to two years in the Philippines teaching, uh, doing research and so on. And then had these graduate students, mostly from Cornell, US uh, and one or two strangers like the Canadian I am. Uh, and uh, so it, it 
had quite a profound influence not only on the University of the Philippines, but also on Cornell's international involvement. Uh, and uh, so, so that as a model uh, for this Kaha program was uh, something that you know, I could easily come back to. And essentially what we're trying to do with Kaha is to train African graduate students in horticulture. So taking students from African countries, bringing them here, letting them do their thesis, partly their thesis, but their coursework and so on here, but then sending them back to their home country or to some international institution in Africa where they would do the bulk of their research, then come back and get a Cornell degree. Then the stipulation is, okay, now that you've done that, you need to devote your time and effort uh, to, to Africa. The second phase, which we're just starting now, is one which involves, which we hope will involve African Americans who again have an interest in horticulture, who have an interest in Africa, and who would be willing to take part in a program such as this. So they would have a, a thesis advisor here, but then link up with an institution in whatever country it might be in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but then finish up here. And hopefully we can twist their arm to uh, then go back and devote uh, at least part of their career to African horticulture. So that's just getting started. The recruitment of students like that may be a problem. I've been asking around people that are experienced in this area and said, eh. might be hard to find students that want, African-American students that want to do horticulture. What's horticulture? It doesn't pay anything. It's not very glamorous. Uh, so we may have a problem finding those particular students that uh, would be suited for this program, but we'll see. Then lastly, okay, Canadian, come here, really didn't have any money. And now you're doing all this. Where does that come from? Well, it's mostly investment. Uh, I'm not an inv uh, investor. I know nothing about stock market, but my late wife, Betty, played in the stock market initially. And then uh, she got involved with MetLife, who said, no, don't do it this way, do it that way, and so on and so forth. So she was the primary influence. Uh, Victor Dillard, who many of you know, uh, uh, was our financial advisor and has been and still is, and he's been really key uh, to, that, uh, uh, to that effort as well. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're transitioning to listen to hear from Kalenga. Um, maybe I'll just mention that the deadline for the new CAHA program is 10 days away. So there's still time to apply and all the information is on the website. Hello, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Kalenga Banda. I am the outgoing CAHA recipient and I'm doing a uh, uh, research in sweet potato storage with Chris Watkins. Uh, before I go into the slides to share a bit of what my research uh, has been about, um, I would just want to talk about uh, my background with Kaha, how uh, my experience has been. So I was um, just coming out of a master's program at Stellenbosch University and I joined the University of Zambia and I was looking for opportunities to get into grad school. And I had my eye on um, two universities, uh, UC Davis and Cornell. So as I was searching um, around for opportunities in Cornell, I came across Kaha and, and for me, that was it. I just felt that this was for me and, and, uh, and I went for it. So um, this uh, program suited me, especially because having come out of a master's program, I worked on pomegranate research and, uh, and, and there was no pomegranate in Zambia. So I was feeling kind of disconnected uh, 
how am I going to contribute to my country? And so I wanted to do research that was uh, going to uh, be, be, be able to solve problems in my country. And so Kaha provided an opportunity for me to do research that could be able to benefit uh, farmers in, in Zambia. And I picked on sweet potato because it's, it's uh, our staple crop is maize and, and everyone is doing research on maize, corn. And, and so I wanted to do something different and I, I, and I knew that there was a problem with storage of, of, um, of root crops and root crops was, uh, is, is, is an important staple, especially when there's a crop failure in, in maize people usually will uh, move on to, to root crops. So then I uh, ventured into, into, this, into this research. But <laughs> life happened. And when I came, in, when we, when I came into Cornell, uh, I, we were not able to fully um, uh, uh, do, as, do what we planned. COVID came in and a few other personal challenges came in. So most of my research was done here in Cornell. And, and we looked at some of the areas that U.S. farmers, um, um, to address some of the challenges that U.S. sweet potato farmers had. But we also had uh, one study that we did in Zambia. So I'll share that at the very end and um, also share how I plan to build on from that particular study. So, so we worked on two uh, problems. We talked, we worked on sprouting in sweet potato and also chilling injury. And so uh, we, um, following on from the success, uh, successful application of ethylene in sweet potato storage, in potato storage, uh, we uh, ventured into research that would look at the effects of both ethylene and one MCP on sweet potato sprouting, looking at um, uh, rates of sprouting, but also looking at uh, sugar changes in, in sweet potato. And, and so we compared different cultivars and, and we found variable effects across uh, different cultivars. And then uh, we also looked at chilling damage, firstly looking at uh, how uh, cultivars vary in their sensitivity to chilling damage. And uh, the purpose of that work was to be able to get some uh, cultivars that would be useful uh, um, uh, for application of some interventions to reduce chilling damage in sweet potato. And we picked on, is it the red one? We picked on, on Bellevue. <laughs> we picked on Bellevue uh, to uh, um, then go on and do another study where we looked at uh, the effects of curing to be able to reduce chilling damage. And I think from the visual, you can, you can see that this is a control samples over 40 days and these were cured samples. And, and you can see by day 40 that curing really reduced chilling damage. And not only that, it did uh, reduce um, uh, 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 hydrogen peroxide and also lipid peroxidation. So we found it as a, as a very useful uh, pre-harvest treatment to use to reduce chilling, chilling damage. And then this is the part, uh, uh, this slide is about some of the work that I did in Zambia. So this was done in 2018. And uh, this was a study that was done to um, assess some of the challenges that sweet potato farmers have. And this is me and the team up there that went up to Northwestern and Central Zambia. And we did um, a survey where we interviewed farmers uh, looking at some of their storage practices, some of the cultural practices and some of the losses and, and, and causes of losses that were associated with those practices. And then uh, uh, some of the key things that came out were things like pest damage, but also uh, the techniques that they use for storage uh, uh, were predisposing the, the roots to, to storage. So many things came out of this study. And um, uh, I will be going back to the University of Zambia at the end of early next year. And I'm hoping to build on from some of these findings to be able to contribute to sweet potato research and, and, and uh, many other um, um, horticultural crops in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So really Cornell uh, Kaha has been a great opportunity to uh, get excellent um, um, education and also uh, to be able to link up with uh, top researchers in the field. And, and I hope to be able to um, 
continue with those collaborations and, and contribute to research in Africa. And, and I, my main goal uh, is to be able to contribute to research on a more regional level. So I have my eyes set on um, regional organizations in, 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 in Africa and across. Thank you. So Sarah mentioned, um, I was the advisor of the first Kaha student, Charles Masson. Um, he's uh, from Kenya, originally from the village of Obama, where until recently, uh, the president's grandmother actually lived. And his project was focused on green beans. So there was some benefit to this because the bean, green bean community is also linked to the dry bean community and the bean community in general are a pretty international community. So we were able to link with uh, people like Talo at USDA Beltsville, Tim Porch in Puerto Rico, who also has a program in Angola. And we set up a project uh, focusing on green beans for uh, heat tolerance and rust tolerance. They, they're a crop that are grown uh, in the higher regions of Kenya. Uh, Lake Victoria is about 1,100 meters. Uh, green beans do well when you get up to the 12, 1,500 meter type of levels where it's more temperate. Um, and it is mostly an export crop there, but only about 15% of the crop gets exported. So the 85% that remains has actually kicked off quite a nutritional domestic supply of that crop. So we worked together from 2006 to 2010. Uh, but what was interesting is, you know, we, we traveled a lot around Eastern Africa together on three or four visits. Um, so we started looking at a lot of other horticultural crops. And I work with brassica vegetables. And probably this image right here is the visit we made back in 2008 where we started looking at a lot of the leafy brassicas in Africa. Sakuba so wiki is to push the weak, it's African kale. And interestingly, this was the point, I think, that about 13 or 14 years of work on leafy brassicas has originated from, which now tells into both the African market and the Kenyan market. So Sakuba so wiki is very important. It's one of the few nutritious crops. Uh, it's very common next to ugali and say beans as a meal. Uh, people go and buy it at the, uh, the local markets, either as the direct leaves or pre-chopped up, ready to cook. And then it's sold really all, it's, it's grown all the way around like Victoria and sold at sort of trade in markets where it goes to these local markets oftentimes. So, this is a crop we decided to collaborate with when he went back, because when he went back, he worked at Isipi for a little bit at Mbita Point. He also went through a little bit on the Uganda sweet potato project. Um, but he had um, got together with a friend of his, Danny Ambok, and Dan had previously worked for USAID. So they got together to set up their own company, their own seed company in Western Kenya realizing that there were huge gaps in the market, especially for horticultural crops. So they've set up uh, Advantage Seed Limited. Um, I was the first signatory in their book for the company that they, they like to have. So with Charles and Dan setting up this company, this really helped to progress a lot of these efforts. Uh, we also got funding from the Atkinson Center back in 2011 or diversification of leafy greens in Eastern Africa, which very much helped. And we've st we started to look at the different types of leafy brassicas that people might like more or that might do better in the different environments. And recently this also played into um, a PhD student who graduated last year, uh, Hannah Swaygarden. Her focus was on kale, mostly for the American market. And she was very interested in uh, engaging consumers, bringing consumers into the breeding process, getting feedback from, the, from consumers to inform 
decisions. So we focused on both the kale types and the sort of cooked collard types, which are more similar to the East African, African kales to do consumer panels. But as part of this, we linked with Charles because you know, it was an opportunity to give Hannah some international experience. It was an opportunity to advance some of these efforts and really get a different perspective. You know, how do consumers in East Africa respond to different types of kale compared to consumers in the US? Plus, I think it's a pretty valuable experience. And Hannah got to go out to Eastern Africa three times during her PhD. So I think just for any student that can be um, an incredible experience. Um, and the work that we set up with Charles was on two seasonal plantains during the wet season. Uh, this is uh, Charles's location in Rodi, Western Kenya. Um, but Hannah was able to go out a few times in the last time for about two or three weeks, staying in Homer Bay. And then working with Charles to get these sort of evaluations of what people liked in the different brassicas and sort of do this contrast. So in, in the meantime, this whole leafy brassica for African kale sort of hit head on with the kale uh, explosion in the US. It also linked with uh, work that we were doing on uh, natural color in brassicas. So it's actually gone in two directions now. One of the directions is to develop the leafy greens for the American market, the, the different colors and shapes. This is something we're doing in the Toscano type. We're moving it to green and golden with the purple thing. But also thinking about what might work going back in the other direction for African markets to try and promote a, a, a nutrition, a, a crop that's high in nutrition, but is also very popular amongst consumers there. So what we've been working towards now is this Toscano collard, because the Sukuma wiki is very similar to the regular collard, this flat leaf, um, and it degrades very, very quickly. Um, what you have with this Toscano collard is early nutritional work that we've done has found that the kales that are high in fiber are very high in carotenoids. So this is very important from a nutritional angle compared to the um, flat leaf. But what you also get from this Toscano Savoy leaf type is something with um, a much longer shelf life when you pick it and take it to market. So you can take it perhaps a greater distance. It's also a product that when you cook it, you have a mu much more product when it cooks down. So you don't lose so much of the solids during the cooking process. So it's also, of course, in hybrids, you can see the two parents of it here aren't anywhere near the vigor of the hybrid. The hybrid can be five times easily the yield of an OP or an inbred parent. So we've been developing these hybrids and now we're hopeful that we can put something together to go back and look at how these or even OP mixes do against some of the current varieties being grown there. And we have these not only in the sort of the, the dark green or the blue green, but also the bright green and even the golden. And what's interesting about these, I think, is that the US kale market is all about the, the raw vegetable market, where the texture gives it the, the crunch and the volume and the ability to hold dressing. So these are actually products that work for both the expanding US markets and to try and improve the East African leafy brassica markets. So um, work continues with Charles. Uh, we've had a couple of Zooms in the last couple of weeks with Kalenga to talk about how we can bring these Kaha relationships together and progressing on some of these projects, whether we can have a sort of a New York, Kenya, um, Zambia type of project going forward, which I think could be um, pretty intriguing and pretty meaningful in what it could contribute. So hopefully we're able to use that. And we all have our, our different strengths to bring to that. Uh, Kalanga is going to be at the University of Zambia. Charles is 
a little bit of a wheeler and dealer and he's linked to the corporate side in uh, Western <laughs> Kenya. And probably I'm the counterpart wheeler and dealer on, on this side. Uh, but we all have different types of positions, but I think they all come together and complement one another. And I, I think provide a platform to pivot from and do something that could be quite special and quite meaningful. So this is, we did have a chance at one point, we were down in Dar es Salaam and we were going to Nairobi. We got a stop over in um, Zanzibar. This is Stone Town, Zanzibar. If you ever get the chance to be in that region, I absolutely recommend it. But I will pass it on to Julian. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian at Curry, and I am the incoming or current uh, Kaha Fellowship holder. And just before I start, I just want to say thank you to our founder, Professor Chris. I mean, this, for someone from Africa, it might not be so obvious to someone here, but for an African, this is a huge opportunity. And the collaboration between Africa and uh, the US and the research, I think it's uh, really needed because if we look at the African setting, and the food systems and the horticulture, there's a lot that needs to be done. So thank you, Paul. Okay, so my research, I'll be looking at mitigating aflatoxin contamination in low resource uh, regions. And I'll be looking at Sub-Saharan um, Africa in, in particular and Uganda specifically. Okay, so just a brief introduction. Uh, aflatoxin contamination is a big problem, especially in the developing countries because the countries have so many challenges that make them prone to aflatoxins in their produce. So basically, aflatoxin is a secondary metabolite that is produced by the fungus aspergillus, and it, is, it contaminates both food and animal feed, and it's, it's still available in the food even after cooking or drying. So it's mostly produced by two uh, fungi, strains, that is Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus, but can also be produced by um, other strains, though these are the most uh, strains that produce uh, aflatoxin. So it's basically very highly toxic. If you look at compar comparing it to other mycotoxins like ochratoxins and cumonicins, this uh, aflatoxin is more prevalent and it's generally more toxic. So climatic conditions favor fungal growth. So if you look at sub-Saharan, I mean, subtropical and tropical regions, these um, high temperatures and drought conditions make the fungus to produce more aflatoxins. So you find that in addition to the problems that the continent I mean, is already is facing, together with the climate, they both um, make aflatoxin contamination a big problem in Africa. So the big problem is that there's significant amounts of aflatoxins in produce from sub-Saharan Africa. And contamination occurs throughout the value chain, right from the field, pre-harvest, at harvest, during storage, and um, also post-harvest. So you find that uh, contamination can occur anywhere along the food value chain, which is a bit challenging. And then the other thing is that um, though Aflatoxin is available in so many products. So you can have the kind of maize, uh, soy, all these products, sorghum and all that. The most uh, susceptible products are maize and groundnuts. So this is very important because if you look at African food systems, most African diets are, plant, most African diets are plant based. And then you find that people consume maize mostly as a carbohydrate source and then groundnut as the um, protein source. And then these two are very susceptible. So you find people consume these products very often. There's very little um, food options. So people consume a lot of maize and groundnuts which are susceptible to contamination. And then you find that people are taking in um, these aflatoxins. So additionally, there's poor regulation and monitoring low resource regions, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but other areas such as India, this is a very big problem. If you look at, if you compare to the developing countries, where uh, monitoring is, 
is done as a regular um, system, it's very lacking, actually, almost not evident, basically, in, uh, in low resource regions. So this is a very big problem. Because we find that at international limit, international markets, aflatoxin contamination exceeds international limits. So in the US, the limit is uh, 20 parts per billion, but the Europe has a more strict uh, market and the international limit is four parts per billion. So you can imagine how hard it is for, to, it is for an African farmer to get into international uh, markets. Okay, so the other thing is that we have very poor practices, right from pre-harvest, post-harvest, and also uh, during storage. Additionally, we have transportation and marketing systems, which are a bit, you know, poor and a bit lacking. So this all together contributes to the problem. Now, after toxins basically uh, impact health, but exposure can be either acute or chronic. Now, the acute is when you're exposed to very high amounts of aflatoxins, and uh, this usually causes uh, hepatic necrosis or mortality. So there's an incident in 2004 in Kenya where more than 100 people actually died from consuming very well, consuming maize that was contaminated with aflatoxin. So we can see how serious the problem is. But then the other thing is chronic exposure. This one, you're exposed to lower amounts of uh, aflatoxins, but over a longer period of time. So this leads to it uh, stunting, especially in children, suppresses the immunity and also liver cancer. And in Africa, this is the biggest problem because people consume these foods that have contaminated aflatoxins and over a longer period of time. So we find that the chronic, chronic exposure is the big problem at the moment. So the other thing is economic losses. Like I mentioned earlier, people, um, farmers rather, produce from these regions have uh, they do not meet the international standards. So we find the products do not, uh, they're rejected when they reach international markets. Now, the other thing is when these products are rejected, produce are rejected from the international markets, they find their way back into the local markets. Now, what happens is these aflatoxin contaminated produce are further processed into things like peanut butter or uh, powder or paste or whatever. And then, they are sold to consumers. Now, after toxins are tasteless, the odorless, you cannot see them. So people consume concentrated, there's basically concentration of aflatoxin in, uh, in, in, in products, which is a big problem. So my research question is, how can you effectively mitigate aflatoxin contamination in low resource regions? And for this research, I'll be specifically looking at Uganda. Now, this is important because one, you want to protect consumer health, and then we want to improve competitiveness of the, of the crop itself. And then we also want to contribute you know, to the food and nutrition security problem. And this is very important because food security is already a problem in Africa. So if you bring in an aflatoxin problem, worsening the, you know, the situation. So if we, can, if we can control this problem, then maybe we can actually improve and contribute to food security in the region. Okay. so. What, uh, what I'm proposing, what we're proposing to do is to improve soil health. So studies have shown that um, the fungus, Aspergillus fungus, tends to produce more aflatoxins in stress conditions. So when, when there's drought, when the temperatures are high, and also when the soils are depleted of nutrients, the aflatoxin contamination is going to be much higher. So um, And th these are all, of course, contributing factors in, in the African region. So if we, if we can improve soil health, we want to use an organic fertilizer and biocontrol. And for biocontrol here, we're use, we want to use, okay, studies have shown that the atoxygenic strains, that is the non-aflatoxin producing strains of aspergillus, they outcompete uh, the toxin producing strains. And then you have a healthier plant, less aflatoxins, uh, and then generally better health. Now, the other thing we want to incorporate in our research is the idea of circular economy, where we want to use uh, sanitation waste as a fertilizer, uh, for example, urine, using it as a fertilizer, and then we shall use the fertilizer, oops, sorry, we use a fertilizer to make, for, to make pro food more for food production, and then use food and market waste to 
make um, to reuse the food and market waste to make products such as a fertilizer and biochar. And these can again be used to make more food. And then you have uh, basically the, I want to incorporate the idea of reusing and recycling products or waste so that uh, you have you know, an environmentally friendly uh, system. And this is very important in Africa because we want um, available, affordable, and sustainable uh, solutions to the African problem. So if we can incorporate that and have a holistic approach, then maybe we can um, improve on the aflatoxin problem in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have a few minutes to um, have a Q&A. So I'm gonna ask all the speakers to just flip their chair around so we can all have a conversation here. And um, yeah, go ahead and ask your questions. I have a question for you, Greg. You can just repeat it. Uh, my question is, did you work in Africa before Charles was your student? Or, did, uh, or was it the Kaha that really got that whole effort started? No, I've been to Africa a couple of times. One for friends went and one was more than Africa. Um, but that's definitely what kicked off all of this is that. And if you could put that right up next to your mask, I think that, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so my question is for uh, Julian, the last speaker. And um, one thought I have yes. is that um, the aflatoxin could be growing uh, because the, let's say, peanut or maize have not, has not been dried completely. So could you tell me what, what is the drying uh, method that is recommended for peanuts, let's say? Okay, so uh, he's asking about the drying method for peanuts. Yeah, specifically peanuts, let's say, or groundnut. For groundnut. Okay, all right. So uh, for drying, in Africa, basically the most drying method that we use is uh, sun drying. Yeah. That is the biggest method. As long as the water content goes down to about 7%, then that is enough. So if, because uh, it depends also on the production, I think. And so if you're having large-scale production, then you're definitely going to use a, drying, a different drying method than compared to um, a small holder farmer. But, uh, but yeah, it's mostly the sun drying that is used. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. So it's, it's uh, after harvest. Yes. And then sun dried, yes. and it's pretty effective method. Uh, yeah, it is fairly effective. The only, the biggest problem is uh, consistency. Consistency. So it's weather, very weather dependent, and so people have to. It's very labor intensive. Also, people have to kind of check them out. Then when it rains or something, put them back in and all that. Yeah. So it's it's not very stable and consistent. And then that's why you have the problem of mold molding because water content sometimes, you know, increases even as the drying is or it's incompletely. I mean, it's not dried completely. So that becomes a bit challenging, but if done right, it's very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So this is here in the back. Yeah, I was also wondering, Julian, about um, kind of the mitigation techniques that you're going to use on aflatoxins uh, and would any of those be like um, maybe a chemical treatment or maybe like a UV treatment or something like that that can disrupt the DNA? Okay, so um, for the techniques, we initially were thinking of going like post-harvest route where we use all these measures like UV and all that, but we, we've decided to really look at it and focus mostly on the soil and the plants because after toxins are mostly produced, more after toxins rather are produced where the plant is stressed and when the soil is poor. So if we can solve the problem at that level, then we can reduce on the post-harvest uh, situation. So what we want to do is look at the soil health, improve the soil health, because a healthier plant is able to fight the aflatoxin uh, fungus, and then also look at uh, biocontrol, 
instead of the UV and all those measures, we look at biocontrol. We are using the atoxygenic strain to outcompete the aflatoxin producing strains of the fungus. So, and this has shown that very stable. Once, that, once the biocontrol is used, I mean, during planting, you find that um, during storage, at post harvest and also throughout storage, the contamination is way, way, way less compared to if you look at the problem at the, from the post harvest uh, angle. So, more of a preventative measure than anything else. Yes. Yep. Yes. Cool. Because Thank you. It's, it's a bit challenging to kind of, um, especially like in low resource regions, it, it, can, it gets a bit challenging to look at just post harvest because of resources and you know time and post availability. So, it's better to solve the problem. Do whatever you want. Yeah, do whatever you want. So, so I have a question for Chris. Uh, what is your vision for Kaha in the next 10 years, 15 years? I hope it will keep, it will continue with more students from Africa. And now if we can find the students from the African American sector either in Canada or here, uh, that that number of students will also increase. And if we're going to have the kind of collaboration that Rick was talking about, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be marvelous that it could even be a, a program that expands uh, post-graduation amongst the people that were involved before? And maybe Rick, you have something to add. Yeah, I think that's the ideal on some sort of network among some of the different countries and institutions that will form the base of the And if Africa is developing very quickly and polyculture to a large extent is being left behind, almost all the research is focused on field crops. Yet we're seeing the cities develop, the supermarkets that we go into, and the apples from New Zealand and the oranges from South Africa and the tomatoes from Israel all crops we grow in that region. The Guasian efforts where people are growing avocados, where they used to grow coffee for multiple times the value. Um, the opportunity um, for really sustainable small farming lies in higher value crops. And even in the years I've been going there, you see that, you see hybrids in Western Kenya like you never saw what I've missed, don't they? Road structures that you never saw. And uh, this is something I think that's neglected while there's so much focus on field crops, just the growing moments of agriculture. And this is one of the efforts that can help. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, again, uh, the new Kaha program deadline is December 1st. So if you um, can share that news of that program with your networks um, that we most appreciated to get a robust poll of candidates. Um, thank you to each of our speakers. This has been a really inspiring hour to hear about how one uh, person's vision can affect so many lives across the continent and to see these synergies across the, the network. Um, so thank you all so much. Please join me in giving our panel a, a big round of applause. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.